What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. Yesterday, a very interesting report was posted that gave us some insight as to where some of these major leaks are coming from in the video game industry, say around Nintendo or Sony, if they wanna have, I don't know, a state of play, and all of a sudden a list of every game in it just appears online. Well, now we have an idea as to where that came from, and we're gonna dive into that one here today. Also, we are going to be talking about Sony when it comes to an adapter that many people in the PC community have been waiting for, and it looks like it's finally a thing for PlayStation VR 2. And then we also have Jeff Keighley, who decided to go on stream and try to lay out expectations for his own big summer game fest happening later on this week. So if you guys enjoy this video, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And of course, members for the channel do get Newswave early. If you'd like to learn more about that and support further, you can click the join button down below this video. And we're gonna start today with an absolute classic of a controller, that being that Xbox S-Type from way back in the day on the original Xbox. Well, now it appears that Hyperkin is going to attempt to recreate this thing and release here in a couple of months. We can see an image of it here posted up. This is over on Pure Xbox, as we now have not only the pre-order date for them, but also the release date. Pre-orders go live July 15th. It's at the price of $50, and it will be releasing August 21st. It's gonna be up on Hyperkin.com, but also on sites like Amazon, so you can, Check it out there. I'm sure with Prime shipping and stuff after reviews come out and it's Hyperkin. I know they're kind of up in the air with their quality around different accessories. So maybe wait for, for reviews. I'm sure I'll probably pick this thing up because I do have a soft spot for the S-Type controller from back in the day with all of those LAN parties we'd have for Halo and then Halo 2. But as for features, it does include impulse triggers, bumpers, black and white buttons, a 3.5 millimeter headset jack, and it is compatible with the Xbox Series X, S, and Xbox One. Unfortunately though, it is a wired controller. So that's one bit of the whole nostalgia experience that I don't mind leaving in the past and just being like, okay, it, it's wireless now and that's just kind of how it is. But I know also Microsoft has some weird stuff when it comes to the wireless protocol and thing with the Xbox. But either way, really cool stuff here, especially for fans of the original Xbox. And I'm sure I'll be checking this one out at some point here on the channel. Also, we finally have an update as to when we can expect Metal Slug Tactics to release. This is a game, by the way, that was originally announced three years ago during an online only E3. Yeah, that feels like it was another lifetime ago at, at this point. But we did get a new trailer you can see in this game is coming out uh, on the PlayStation 4, 5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, S, Nintendo Switch, and PC. They say it's releasing this fall. That's kind of it. They, they didn't necessarily uh, tell us an exact release date, nothing like that. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering if this is something that maybe is at Summer Games Fest. I mean, the fact that they are at least coming out and saying it's fall 2024. I mean, we're not too far off from that. So I assume an event coming up here soon will probably have that release date. So this is cool. I mean, I, I like the idea of a tactics style take on the Metal Slug franchise. I think it could at least be kind of interesting. It's just, it's been, it's such flux. Uh, they've delayed it multiple times. So finally, it looks like we're going to see it in a few months, but first we have to get that release date. So we'll keep an eye out some of these big events coming up for it. Oh, and speaking of release dates, we finally got one for Kena Bridge of Spirits on the Xbox. They did release a new trailer to outline this. It is coming out August 15th, and this is a game that came out, again, what feels like forever ago in 2021 on the PlayStation, and I played it there. I enjoyed it for what it was, and I think a year later it came to Steam because it was an Epic Game Store exclusive. This game's gone through multiple bouts of timed exclusivity, but finally now it is coming to the Xbox on August 15th, and I do recommend checking it out. I thought it was kind of an interesting uh, sort of action adventure style game with some little Pikmin elements, I guess you can say, uh, thrown in there. But again, make sure you check this one out here in a couple of months. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with Sony announcing a new adapter, something that people in the PC community and technically in the PlayStation community as well have been waiting for for a while. It, it seemed like the writing was on the wall for the PSVR 2 because Sony just really hasn't made a big push to support it. Really since it came out when they had at least a game with Horizon Call of the Mountain, it's been pretty quiet for any big releases from Sony. I guess Gran Turismo 7 is still the best use of the headset overall, especially from Sony, but that is technically a mode in a game that wasn't built from the ground up necessarily for their VR headset. But now, 
it is going to PC. All right, so they had already told us this was happening, but now in a new blog post we can see posted up, uh, they do say players will need to purchase a PlayStation VR 2 PC adapter, which will be available for an estimated retail price of $59.99 starting August 7th. Looks like a little breakout box, kind of similar to what we have with the PS, PS4 VR, the first PS VR. Get a little breakout box that went from the headset then to the system, and I guess just took care of all different tasks between the two devices. So here, you kind of just have this set up for the PlayStation VR 2 so that it can then plug into, for example, a DisplayPort 1.4, which you'd be running then up to your uh, video card there, and that way it can set up and, for the most part, function correctly. There, I say for the most part, because we're still missing out on some stuff here. So for example, HDR, headset feedback, eye tracking, adaptive triggers, and haptic feedback, other than just rumbles, it can still rumble, of course, but it won't give you the similar haptic feedback they get through the PS5. I'd say it's not available when playing on PC. They do go on to say that other high fidelity and sensory immersion features of PSVR 2 are supported, including 4K visuals, you have 2000 by 2040 per eye, 110 degree field of view, finger touch detection, and see-through view, as well as foveated rendering without eye tracking. So essentially what that means is where you are looking in the scene will render better, we'll say, or clearer than stuff in your peripherals. And that's something that has worked very, very well for VR, especially when it comes to frame rate, because you have to keep a certain level of frame rate, obviously, otherwise you can have motion sickness and that sort of thing. They'll say that 3D audio is supported in games. So obviously we have some good and some bad here. I mean, the good is this should, I assume, at least give some sort of push to the PSVR 2. It is like really, really small, at least, Someone out there who's been waiting for this will, will pick it up, especially now because the PSVR 2 right now is $100 off. So it's $450, the $6 adapter is $510. Okay, sure. In, in the world of PC, when you have video cards that are north of $1,000 at times, a $500 headset isn't going to seem as bad as when you put it next to the $500, $450 $50 PS5. But still, this seems like kind of like a half step from Sony to come up with this really breakout box adapter that still cuts out like half of the features that really make the PSVR 2, you could say unique or special, paired with that PlayStation 5. Especially with the Quest 3 out there, you can hook that up to the PC and use that just as a headset outright or leave it unhooked and have it as an all-in-one device. Now, I do think the PC community will probably figure some of this stuff out as it seems to be more uh, software limited, I guess, and we've seen the PC community take matters in their own hands for basically everything, so I will be curious to see what uh, what PC gamers and, and, uh, and, and homebrew developers and stuff are able to figure out here with this new adapter, but for now, we'll find out as this does release August 7th, so we have a bit of a wait, but I'm curious to see how all of this plays out with PSVR 2 finding a new audience with PC gamers. Next up, let's talk about a very interesting report that essentially outs a major source for some of these leaks that you see pop up online. Like, I don't know, the state of play list that showed up just ahead of it airing online where all the games were there. And there were a few I saw on that list. I, you know, you see the lists, right, that go out there. And it's people who are taking pictures of a computer screen. And it's like, okay, come on, guys. Like, like look at all these games. on This is like a wish list. But that state of playlist, there were a couple games on there. I was like, oh, this might actually be the entirety of their announcements for this 35-minute uh, state of play. And it was. Which, of course, leads people to wonder, okay, how exactly does this get, how do these things get out there? People have always wondered. There has been a running theory for quite a while that it has to do with YouTube and its backend. Well, based on a new report, it appears that's actually the case. And in fact, it's uh, looking pretty serious actually with some of the stuff that's been going on here. So we can see this post up. This is from Insider Gaming, who's also quoting uh, another publication, that being 404 Media, who broke the story, says, has allegedly obtained an internal Google database tracking six years of potential privacy and security issues. There are many on there, by the way, outside of just gaming. It's, um, it's some pretty wild stuff. One employee has been responsible for several leaked Nintendo announcements in the past. The report is based on information, though, spanning from 2013 
to 2018, which, I mean, think about it, that time, we had all the stuff going around about the Switch leading up to its release, and then subsequent releases after the system came out, and there was stuff leaking all over the place, if you remember, at that time. But to go a bit further here, Insider Gaming says, according to our sources, who wish to stay anonymous as they were not authorized to talk about the company's internal processes, your videos are not just watched for monetization approval. They are watched by employees all the time. This included anything private, scheduled, or unlisted, showcases, game announcements, and other footage not intended to see the light of day. And this has been the running theory for quite some time, that YouTube employees are able to watch, say, a premiere for a Nintendo Direct or a Sony State of Play, and basically jot down all the announcements and then just put it out there online. Or, as Insider Gaming is pointing out here based on one source, sell the information. They said it was like three figures, so, okay, like a hundred bucks or something. Hey, here's all the announcements. I mean, that's some pretty serious stuff, if that is the case. Again, this is like from one source that alleged this, but if there are people within Google or YouTube who are viewing this stuff from these major companies who are, yes, trusting the platform when it comes to privacy of Pretty serious announcements in general. I mean, there's so much money tied up in gaming now for these announcements to go smoothly. And then it just appears online like that. You're, you're going to think twice about putting your event on YouTube, right? So that is something that YouTube, I'm sure, would be looking into, especially with a report like this being made public. But this happened before, uh, as Insider Gaming pointed out, uh, KSI had been doing gift card giveaways and stuff. And because the code was in the video... Uh, they were already redeemed when the video was like went live and they're trying to figure it out. Turns out, yeah, maybe some people within YouTube got to look at that code and decide to redeem it. And this doesn't really surprise me too much because it, if you're on YouTube and you've uploaded videos and you've had monetization checks, I mean, it's pretty clear at times because they'll do manual review that they do watch the video. So if they're able to watch your video when it's not public and it's just sitting there either private or unlisted waiting, say, for monetization approval or checks to complete, well, there you go. So there could be some serious information in there and now they know it ahead of time before it's made public. So this, I think, will make companies like Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft, whoever really who wants to have some sort of breaking presentation happen at the exact moment without anything leaking from uploading ahead of time and... I don't know, dealing with processing as it's ongoing. That's the other thing. It's like, do you want to upload it and at the at the exact moment and deal with 360p for the first 30 minutes? Uh, as with how serious a lot of these games are sold on their graphical fidelity, probably not. But that will make them reconsider a lot of the stuff when it comes to marketing and YouTube, but again, I feel like YouTube is probably looking into this now more than ever with this report being public. Next up, let's talk about Jeff Keighley working to set expectations for his two hour show this Friday, that being Summer Game Fest, which we're all tuning in and treating like, well, E3, because there is no E3, so naturally looking to the next big event with Summer Game Fest. Well, Jeff Keighley did take to Twitch to do a live stream and essentially do a Q&A and answer all kinds of questions with the chat. And look, we can see this post up. This is over on Rock Paper Shotgun. They say, this Jeff Keighley quote, there will be definitely new announcements, but the show is largely focused on, I think, existing games that have new updates for fans. He's mentioned this ahead of time. He said, to set expectations. And that's probably a good idea. Again, there is no E3 this year. People are honing in on this with some big time announcements. I saw discussion around Kingdom Hearts 4 being there and he kind of played it off like, oh, well, good luck with that one. That's Disney. They're going to do it when they want, which might just be what, a D23, their, their own event, maybe. But also, that's exactly what I would say if I had that Kingdom Hearts 4 reveal locked down. Well, okay. I wouldn't go into this expecting that. And I think Jeff is at least doing the more responsible thing, quote unquote, here and trying not to hype up this show that he, I mean, let's be, let's be real. He knows the announcements. He's looking at them and he's wondering, well, I, I don't have a Grand Theft Auto 6 trailer, something like, some kind of reveal like that. It's not going to have a big one more thing, apparently. And it's going to be, I don't want to say a more flat year for these announcements, but it's not going to be an over the top hype year necessarily for Summer Game Fest. So I'd recommend going in with those kind of expectations set. Go in, sure, still excited because you're going to see some new games. You're going to get updates for, I'm sure, popular titles, but it's not going to be anything earth shattering. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about Ubisoft and two projects from them. 
that I am very interested in. I think many people are actually, because this kind of gets away from what we expect from Ubisoft, which is the open world, live service, fatigue inducing structure of their big core franchise. Not that people aren't fans of things like Assassin's Creed, but you get the idea, you go into it knowing what to expect from the tried and true Ubisoft formula. But two games that are kind of bucking the trend here would be Prince of Persia Sands of Time Remake and the Splinter Cell Remake, both of which seem to be not only full speed ahead on development, but one, might be close to wrapping up. Well, we can see this is posted up. This is over on X and from the Ubisoft Toronto account saying Ubisoft Toronto is joining the development of the remake of Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. We're excited to rewind time and bring our studios, creativity, expertise, and updated tech to refresh this beloved classic with our partners at Ubisoft Montreal. Now Ubisoft Montreal is leading development on Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. And I do like, I mean, th at this point they have two of their like top studios on this thing right now, which is really cool to see Ubisoft push forward like this with Sands of Time after the reception to the original uh, showing of the remake, which was, wasn't great. But the other thing with this that's interesting is Ubisoft Toronto, they were working on Splinter Cell, the remake, and that was, announced what like two and a half three years ago and it seemed like they announced it in the sense of hey we're also hiring and they were even hiring as early as the beginning of this year but now it seems like all the job listings were full they don't need anyone else and it does make me wonder if this is signaling that they've mostly done like the bulk of the development is wrapping up and they're working maybe towards a release date or finally a big reveal for it and Ubisoft Forward is next week. That's on the 10th. So will we see Splinter Cell there, the remake? I I kind of think we might. It could also be a summer game fest. Like I said, there, there are a lot of events coming up where Ubisoft could just drop Splinter Cell in because obviously the big focus, I think, at their Forward is going to be Assassin's Creed. They're going to close out with that. There'll be gameplay there, that whole thing. So why not let Splinter Cell breathe a little bit away from that and... I don't know, drop it in. You can drop it in Xbox to show even. There are all kinds of places you could have this reveal. And the fact that Ubisoft Toronto is seemingly moving a lot of their resources now over to help develop Prince of Persia gives me hope. So we'll keep an eye out for Ubisoft here in the next week or so. And before we go to the comment of the day, we'll take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday where I ask, have you played the original Splinter Cell from 2002? 56% say no, 44% say yes. Let me tell you, when that game released back in the day on like the, the Xbox, then on the PS2 and the GameCube, and you played it on any of the systems, it was incredible stuff. Like the lighting was next level. That was a moment where you felt like, okay, I, we have moved into the next generation because think about it, we came from the PS1 and the Nintendo 64, those sort of visuals. And now we're seeing light like going through and casting a shadow through a fan. That was a big deal then. You had the split jump and kind of the next level stealth. What an awesome, awesome time in gaming back then with the original Splinter Cell. And then obviously the Pandora Tomorrow chaos theory, but that first Splinter Cell was just incredible stuff. So the fact that so many people here haven't necessarily played it, I I do wonder maybe the Splinter Cell remake can recapture some of that magic. I, we'll see. It, it comes down to how Ubisoft is going to treat this thing. And based on the way that they have described it, still sticking true more to the original one than what we're used to with Ubisoft, it gives me hope. So... Here's hoping they are able to show it next week, maybe at the Ubisoft Forward or sooner at one of these other events. And we'll finish up with the comments of the day as you're seeing here. This is from 3Com who says, seeing something like Concord make it to an eventual release versus Time Splitters Revival being developed only to get shut down saddens me. That's something else I saw brought up a lot with Concord is people saw Concord and they were like, look at all this other stuff that got canceled. And Concord still made it out of the game. I mean, Last of Us was the big one, obviously that was gonna get brought up, but Twist of Metal, that got canceled too. Like stuff like that does make you scratch your head a bit. But the only thing I can think of is Sony legitimately said, oh, cool. We can have our own Overwatch. It's incredibly successful. Even if we capture 20 or 30% of what Overwatch was able to, we'll consider that a win. That's the only thing I can think of right now because that must've been a really good pitch five or six years ago when it made more sense. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today, where there's the source of some of these leaks over the last several years being from 
YouTube. Does that surprise you that some Google employees may have been looking through these videos for announcements then? Also, what about the PlayStation VR 2 PC adapter? Are you now considering picking up this headset for your PC? And Summer Game Fest, where are your expectations right now for the show heading into it? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.